So now that we're convinced that we should analyze algorithms, how are we going to proceed? We need to have some techniques for measuring the resource use of our algorithms. Now by resource use, we're typically going to be talking about running time and memory use. There are other things we could measure. There are some algorithms, for example, that can output multiple solutions or one of a number of solutions, and we could measure somehow the quality of the solution. But for the rest of this course, we're going to focus only on algorithms that have a single correct answer as an output, and we're going to consider only running time and space use. And in fact, running time is going to dominate our analysis. In practice, running time is usually more important than space, although there are exceptions. So the first thing to think about is we want to measure the running time, let's say, of the algorithm, not of a particular program. We don't want to be concerned with issues such as the speed of the machine we're using, right? the programmer, the particular language, the particular compiler. These are all irrelevant from our purposes. Because in practice, if I have an algorithm A and an algorithm B, and the second one is better, according to my analysis, turns out that when you actually implement it, all other things being equal, using the same implementation, the second implementation will actually be better than the first one. It will run faster, for example. So we want to look only at the abstract level, ignoring all these other issues. Second, what do we mean by how fast is the algorithm? The running time is typically going to depend on the input. The larger the input, the longer it's going to take to process in general. So we need to understand that and clarify all these issues, in fact. Also, we don't really care about the performance of algorithms on tiny, tiny inputs. There is a trade-off here. If you spend an enormous amount of time analyzing an algorithm, it may be intellectually interesting, but if you're never going to run it on anything more than a tiny little input, maybe it's not worth the effort. It may be better just to implement the first algorithm you think of, and you could have that all done, the answers already completed, before the person who's doing the serious algorithm analysis even has a chance to get going. What's really important are large inputs. And the key thing about our algorithm analysis is that the speed ups or the savings that we make from doing it increase as the input size increases. So this is a key point. We're going to actually have to study the performance of our algorithms on sequence of inputs with increasing size. So the basic procedure we're going to do is this. We're going to have to come up with some kind of way of measuring the size of the input. Usually that's not too difficult. We have a lot of freedom for that. The input size, let's say n, could be the size of the array that we're sorting. Number of records that you need to sort. For example, there are many, many ways to do it and we have to specify it. But at least we should be able to come up with some measure of how big the input is. And then we might want to look at the running time, for example, as a function of the input size. That's the kind of thing we want to be measuring. Now we can't use clock time or anything that's dependent on the implementation details because we're looking at an algorithm rather than a program. So the key idea we're going to use is what's called an elementary operation. Now this term just means any type of operation which when translated into code is going to be performed in some fixed amount of time. We don't care how long, as long as there's an upper bound on how long it will take for such an operation. And that number does not depend on the input size. So a classic example would be adding two small integers. That's a basic operation. You may need to do a lot more of them when you have a larger input as part of your overall algorithm. But that specific operation, although it takes different amount of time on different machines, should still be fixed for a given implementation. So what we're going to do is use elementary operations as our basic measuring stick to determine how long an algorithm takes to run. So thinking back to last time when we talked about Fibonacci numbers and the fast algorithm, 
that I presented for that. I said that that algorithm ran in linear time. What do we mean by that? Well, here it is again. Seems pretty obvious that any kind of an execution of an if, an else, stepping through a for loop, an assignment, an addition, these things should all be elementary operations. They're all going to be done in a fixed bounded amount of time in a particular implementation. On different machines, with say different compilers, different chips, they will take different amounts of time. There may even be very slight variations in how long they take, depending on how fancy your processor is. But they're not going to take a time which grows massively, even as the input grows massively. The idea is, as n increases, you have to do more and more elementary operations, but each elementary operation has some sort of fixed bounded amount of time. We want to count how many of them we're doing, roughly, in order to see how efficient our algorithms are. Now your first question might be, why does it matter? Why is it so important? That's what we want to have a look at now. So take a look at this table, and we'll first look at the row labeled linear. So we're looking there at a function whose growth is of the order of n. In other words, it looks like some constant times n. The various values of n are on the right, 10, 100, 1000, and 10 to the 7 sample points. You'll see there that in fact the constant I mentioned is actually 1 tenth because when n equals 10, the value of the function is 1. It's one time unit. It could be a clock time unit, like a nanosecond, or it could just be an elementary operation. It really doesn't matter. We're just looking at the growth rate of the function. Notice that as the input size goes from 10 to 100 to 1000 to 10 to the 7, for a linear function, the output, the value of the function, goes from 1 to 10 to 100 to 10 to the 6. It's scaling proportionately with the input, and that's not surprising. If the running time is some constant times n, and then we feed in an input which is, let's say, 100 times larger, nothing special about the number 100 here, we're going to get a running time of c times 100n. That's of course equal to 100 times cn, and that's 100 times the original running time. In other words, the running time scales by whatever the input scales by. That's what happens for a linear algorithm. Well, that's all well and good, but unfortunately not all algorithms run in linear time, and some are very, very much slower. I want to draw your attention here in this table to the bottom right-hand corner. This is the place you always want to avoid. If you have a slow algorithm and a large input size, you're in for a lot of pain, or at least a lot of time wasting. For example, suppose you have a cubic time algorithm. Then if we multiply the input size by 100, the running time scales by a factor of a million. And you can see that once the input size gets to say 10 million, in that particular example, you're already looking at an enormously long running time. Imagine that each elementary operation takes one nanosecond, which seems not too far off, a reasonable estimate. Then you're going to take uh, four months to deal with a problem like that of size 10 million, even though you could do a problem of size 10 in one nanosecond. But if you had a linear time algorithm for the same problem, it would only take you a millisecond rather than several months. When you get to exponential time algorithms, it gets way, way worse. Right? Already, by increasing from 10 to 100, we already get to a number which is very large. Right? We're talking about a billion, getting of the order of a billion centuries to solve that problem. 
the numbers in the very bottom right are so big you can't even understand how big they are. So to reiterate, we want to stay as high up this table as we can and avoid the bottom right. That's not always possible. It seems that there are some intrinsically hard problems for which we're forced to go down this table. But most of the problems we'll deal with in this course, it is possible to use fast algorithms to solve them. Now we come to the important part, as usual, the questions. Okay, The very small bite-sized lectures give you an introduction to the topic. First question. Suppose you have two algorithms for the same problem. How can you decide which one to use, at least in terms of efficiency? There may be other reasons to decide. One of them might be really hard to code up and to implement. Depending on the size, it may not be worth the effort, the size you're going to run it on. But let's suppose that it is worth the effort. For example, it could be a library routine that you want to do. To see it's going to be used by many people, so it's definitely worth having a look at. Or you may have a very large input, and it's important to be as efficient as possible. In any case, we have algorithm A and B, and they have different running times, as you can see there. One of them scales like n squared, the total amount of elementary operations for input size n, and the other is more like a constant times n log n. Okay. So you need to remember that this is the binary logarithm, log to the base 2, if you remember that from the mathematics supplementary lecture. So first of all, which algorithm would you use for a specific value of n? And how do you solve that? Okay, that's the first question I want you to think about. The next one is a more fundamental kind of an issue. What happens if we have integers that are quite big. If we're calculating the nth Fibonacci number and n is a million, that's a big number. Okay, It'll involve some very big additions. Additions of very large numbers. Does that affect the analysis we've done? Next thing I want you to ask about is going back to the idea of input size. We can measure it any way we like, actually, as long as we're consistent. But some measures are kind of silly, others make more sense. If we're looking at f of n, the nth Fibonacci number, I said that the input is the integer n, and implicitly I was using n as the size of that integer. I was saying that uh, the running time is basically scaling like some constant times n, plus some other constant, a n plus b, something like that. And so I was calling it a linear time algorithm. Does that really make sense? Is it a good way to measure the size of the integer n? So these are some of the issues I'd like you to think about. Until next time.